So um, the provocation title um, is do we need to deinstitutionalize first? Um, and this is with focus around decolonizing um, the curriculum. So I've recently, I still say recently, I joined um, our teaching and learning division within Salford fairly recently in October. And actually, um, I was quite surprised to see where we were in terms of making progress and um, how we've not really made connections. And when I looked more widely, I noticed that across the sector, this was a, a particular um, issue coming from a research background, knowing that there is really good research out there, that it hasn't really come forward into um, a teaching practice space at this point. Lots of great pieces of work happening, um, but not fully fledged and not we're not actually seeing it changing the landscape in the way we would hope. So I started to question um, around this and look at, you know, what are the factors which may be constraining um, that development? And um, I started to think along the lines of do we actually need to deinstitutionalize in order to make way for decolonizing our curriculum? So that was the sort of basis of this provocation. And I've pulled together some of the sort of key thinking um, around this and what, what we hope to get out of the discussion today. Um, with that in mind, um, looking through that lens, we're really sort of taking a social cultural approach um, and increasing awareness, particularly around anti-racist pedagogy and policies that integrate with that structure. Um, but looking at the structures themselves, this idea of dismantling structures of domination, and it was really interesting um, in preparing for today, I was thinking about the structures that exist and we sort of navigate and perhaps not really think about. And I was thinking about that journey of teaching and research and how we tend to sort of categorise into those spaces. Is this work which is teaching focused or work which is research based? Um, and also how ingrained some of our infrastructures are in higher education. And those are really, really difficult structures to, to challenge or dismantle. Also really looking at the need to examine those cultural patterns within organisations and structures. And are these maintaining um, the present day racial equalities? Also looking at that structures in mind approach. So is it rather than just the physical environment that we occupy um, or the virtual environment, but actually ways of thinking? Um, so this was a, another stream of thought. Um, you know, is that way of thinking actually reproducing racial narratives? And also, as part of this discussion, inviting examples of where we have dismantled the practice so that we can take things forward, um, looking at where we're maybe only scratching the surface, what we could do to, to deepen that, um, and, and where those critical impacts and practices are, what impacts um, are we having in this space? So lots and lots of questions, and not necessarily we're getting to those answers today, but to have that wider discussion. And just to put this in context, um, this discussion has been um, generated at Salford. We've started having this discussion. Um, most recently, um, I attended a, a Salford-led conference around decolonising and we, we did a bit of similar work in this space. So this is a real opportunity for more input into that and more discussion um, to see what the direction of travel may be. So just um, a, a brief sort of touch base on this concept um, of deinstitutionalisation. And as I mentioned, it's a social cultural approach um, grounded in the, the work that Adams did back in 2008. And it's this idea of um, really breaking down these structures um, as, as we frame it, structures of domination and structures of mind um, and linking back to, to SALTA research more recently. 
where we are at the moment, lots of things have started to happen, but um, a, a common debate is, are we just scratching the surface? Are we doing enough? Do we need to do more? Um, and that's somewhat of a leading question because I think, yes, we do need to do more, um, but what should that look like? What are the impacts and practices that we can generate and, and space we can move into? So what I've tried to do is structure this session with a, a number of questions where um, we'll pose a question, we'll have some time to reflect and then um, open up for a wider discussion. Um, I also have a, a Jamboard which um, you can use as well as the chat. So the Jamboard um, we can look at, um, it's a slightly free way if you want to use visuals um, and other things rather than just the chat on its own, but either way is fine. So just picking up on some of the questions, some um, really great questions coming through. Give some examples of these structures in a practical sense. Yeah. Um, so one structure may be the um, hierarchy which we have within a, an institution. So we, we have um, certain levels. Um, for example, we've got lecturer, senior lecturer, professor. Um, we've also got the similar levels which happen within research um, that go from researcher, reader um, and professor and so on. We have them within um, non-academic areas as well. But each one has a single channel and there's very little crossing over between those channels so it's very difficult because you have to identify which channel you're going to progress in um, for example along your uh, career and really work hard to progress in that channel um, there aren't many other organizations outside of higher education where you have these very fixed routes of progression and this is just purely on a, a career development they exist elsewhere um, for example within um, the curriculum we have it by level by program level or course level level, um, we can't compartmentalise into the modular, into the programme. So these structures, structures are really inherent within our practice in higher education, but they don't tend to exist in the same way in other organisations and other sectors. So it can be really difficult to transfer good practice um, or good examples or, um, for example, career pathways from one area to another. And this could be one of the constraints which um, is holding back a, a lot of the, the positive work which has already started to take place in this area. So that's just one example of um, how those structures may interact. And they're often not necessarily the structures we think of when we're looking at decolonising. So this is just a bit of a, a background uh, around that, um, but essentially there may be other structures, there may be other constraints which um, I personally haven't considered or others haven't considered. Um, and again, I think um, having a wider discussion with uh, lots of uh, different voices in that space uh, will help us to identify some of those potential areas. So. The first question, just to um, position um, and, and just to pick up on the uh, questions in the chat keep, to keep coming back to those. Um, yes, we will make the slides uh, available so um, you'll be able to access these and the Jamboard if you would like to on an ongoing basis. So the first question to pose and um, is what activities define scratching the surface and what is going deeper? So uh, just to give a, an example of that, um, recently I came across uh, different practices in the sector, speaking to different um, academics who felt because they changed their reading list um, and decolonised their reading list, that they felt that was enough to do in this space. And actually, I felt it was really missing the point that the, it's more of a holistic approach and actually just going through a process around one particular area and just keeping that in isolation um, is just one small step. But why not apply that more largely? Um, why not scale that up to the whole module, to the whole course, to the whole programme? And um, again, that really sort of linked into this idea of those institutional um, constraints, those structures, um, or is it that we're sort of 
performing against more of a tick box exercise where we do the things which are easy to tick off rather than getting into that deeper sense of making a change for the better. So lots of questions it generated, but I wanted to bring it to this forum as part of the provocation and really to consider what activities define just scratching the surface and what do we think is going deeper. So I'll just leave this question up there um, just for, for a moment and I've put some prompts, don't feel you have to use these. Um, this was really just uh, me sort of vocalising what was going on in my mind to help me get to certain points, um, which was thinking about um, the uh, approaches which felt they were merely scratching the surface. Um, how do we move beyond them? Is it a case of um, connecting with hearts and minds or does it have to be more of a compliance shift to, to make it um, part and parcel of what we put in as, as regulation, um, taking advantage, if you like, of those structures which may be in place? Um, and how do I identify where those critical impacts and practices are? So those are just some prompts, but as I say, please don't feel you've got to use those. Just to reiterate the question, what activities define scratching the surface? What is going deeper? So I'll just give you uh, a few um, moments to consider and reflect on that. Um, there is a link to a Jamboard if you prefer to use Jamboard. Um, so that's in the chat at the moment. Um, I'll just copy the link again and paste it for, for those who just joined us. You might not be able to see it. So I'll just pop that in there if you prefer to use the Jamboard instead. And we'll revisit both the Jamboard and the chat in a few moments. Just for reflecting, I'll just mute my microphone um, just so there's no interference in the noise there. OK, so really great to see some um, fantastic things coming through in the chat. So I've just put in the, the context of the of that particular example about the the, the reading list. Um, but would anybody like to volunteer any thoughts in response to this particular question or provocation? You'd like to pop up your hand or post in the chat or if you prefer to share on the Jamboard, we can have a look at Jamboard as well, which I'll do now. We'll just have a look to see some great comments on there. Let me see if I can make that a little bit bigger. Um, let me try, there we go. I do like to test my eyes occasionally, but that's really, really testing it. <laughs> so I'll just make that a, a little bit bigger. That's great. Okay, I'll make that wider as well. So great examples in the chat, first of all. We've got um, example surface changing reading lists of log um, of modules, deeper, more representation from the coloured teachers and pedagogies because the teachers hold knowledge. Um, let's have a look. There's something that's come through from Google Drive, which I can't quite link to. So um, that may be an access issue, but feel free to repost on there. Oh, is this the, is it coming up with an error message? Hopefully I've sent the right link. Okay, let me repaste the link. I have had it before on Teams where I've had to actually copy and paste it out of Teams rather than link through, so that might be connected. Yeah. Yeah, the Zoom board is quite <laughs> quite tiny there, I'll link out. So let's have a look at um, the Jam board in a bit more detail. I'll just um, come out of that a little bit. Hopefully we'll still be able to see some of the, the comments there. So um, some really interesting examples. We've invited students to share their experience. Um, we've diversified the case studies we use. Um, just picking from the other side, we've undertaken research about the experience of students from the global majority on placement. Let me try and make this a bit bigger as well. Um, so I'm drawn to the, the blue post it actually, going beyond the service involves treating colonialism and decolonising as ongoing process experiences rather than something to be done. Yeah, 
once, I agree. And I think that was the the point really with the um with the reviewing of the reading list. It felt like I've done that now. I'll I'll move on. Um, but actually, it's part of an ongoing practice. So I'm just going to come to um, the room. Melanie, can I come to you, please? Yeah, I was going to ask um because you spoke about surface and 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 going beyond the surface, and um I think it would be interesting to think about what a reading list is, um versus what a learning resource is, because the reading list is supposed to be a learning resource. I think it's important to think about knowledge in the conversation around decoloniality, and so. There is the, you know, the characteristics bit around the gender of the authors and the ethnicity of the authors, even where the authors come from geographically. But actually, is there a question around the type of knowledge that's being produced? Who's producing the knowledge? Where are you getting these resources from? Uh, if we're saying that these are academically approved resources, who does that exclude? Um, has there been, let's say from the perspective of the librarians where you would get your resources from, has there been an intentional investigation to find resources that are not easily accessible through these regular publication deals or the read and publish deals? Because we understand the implications of being published in certain journals means you produce certain types of knowledges. Um, so I think it's, I think there's a question on decoloniality going beyond the surface of, have we engaged with a diverse group of authors or diverse um, types of resources even and going behind that question and asking where is the knowledge come from who validated this knowledge and does that in some cases wash down what type of knowledge it is or does that in some cases mean certain knowledges just don't get engaged with um, and that's the thing for teachers lecturers but also librarians researchers who I guess the question is always who gets to produce knowledge, whose knowledge gets shared, you know, the language that the knowledge is in, is it because it's in English, it means it's easier accessible and therefore are we excluding certain types of knowledges because it's in Spanish or because it's in a different language? Um, yes, are we, con are we considering research that doesn't necessarily go through the standard academic perspective of what scientific research means and therefore negating certain types of knowledges because it isn't produced in a way that could be submitted through the ref let's say um, so I think going beyond the surface of diversifying authors and even geographically diversifying it's the question of who's producing the knowledge who's validating the knowledge and therefore whose knowledge is are we excluding um, who's how easy is it to access the knowledge because we know that a large part of decolonizing is capitalism and therefore only certain people get to produce knowledge when it comes to that side of things so I think it's way deeper than just looking at the range of diverse authors yes definitely and i think um it, you know part of that provocation is it, it's a very sort of narrow focus and the who you know who has voice um and agency in that development of the reading list but as, as i say more broadly within our higher education um areas it's very much you know it's we find ourselves in a gatekeeping position and um how do we regulate that to ensure we 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 bring forward the the voice um, and the, it was interesting conversation I had outside of higher education with um, uh, Salford uh, Voluntary Services, so our Salford um, CVS, which um, I work very, very closely with. And they have a, a very much a flipped approach to what we have in, in higher education, where the voice is important and the question isn't asked whether this voice is valid initially it's there is a voice coming through and all voices should be heard and they do a lot of work within um with different charities within the area of of Salford and I thought it was really interesting how um in in an academic setting we always challenge the credibility of the voice Whereas the in a different setting, it's the voice itself which is important and therefore all voices should be heard. So it's very much a, a different and of course they, they have a different, um, their structures are different and for good reason. Um, but it was interesting to see that very um, almost flipped approach. 
to what we currently have. Um, so thank you for, for participating in, in that and uh, in, in that first sort of provocation there. Um, there are a couple more um, I'd, I'd like to, to mention and then we, we can open up to a, a wider di discussion. Um, so thinking about, and I think we've really started to pull through the sort of things which feel like we're scratching the surface and the sort of things which are going to move us into a more deeper area. Um, so on with that, that in mind, how do we actually dismantle those structures, those cultural patterns? Um, and it may be cultural, it may be within the organisation structure, um, but they're continuing uh, a certain practice. And when I think about the journey um, that decolonising has been on, it's, it's actually, I know we've had the pandemic um, for a few years in between, but actually it's been quite a long process. It's been around for a long time. And in theory, perhaps the progress should be much faster, vaster, uh, we, we should be moving into different spaces. And um, I was really starting to reflect on why that perhaps hasn't happened in the same way as other um, other areas within teaching practice. Um, I haven't an answer for that, um, but I, I do appreciate um, the, the present environment and landscape that we're in, you know, post pandemic. It hasn't been easy the past few years and um, there has been other things to focus on in, in some particular disciplines, particularly. Um, so uh, it's really to open up how do we decide dismantle these cultural patterns, organisational structures that are maintaining um, our present day racial equalities. And again, some prompts if you um, feel that you, you want to use them. Um, what can we challenge? Um, what perpetuates this behaviour? Um, how do we move beyond? And again, coming back to those critical impacts and practices. So I'll just mute my microphone for a few moments just while we reflect on that. And um, again, feel free to use the chat um, or to use the, the Jamboard as well. OK, so just moving back to the Jamboard, um, there's a, a, a few new adages which are great. Um, the difference between decolonality and decolonisation is essential to mention too both the ideological and the practical. Yes, that's a really interesting point. And also, um, I think we need to work collaboratively with students and the communities we serve to develop more authentic case studies, reading lists, etc. Those are two really good points there. And just to link back to um, the, the chat, um, interesting thoughts coming up around perhaps some of the differences between higher education and further education. And, and that's something I've not considered, actually, um, where there may be um, differences uh, uh, assuming similar structures, but perhaps that's not the case. Um, so we've got a, a hand up here. So Hamid, can I come to you, please? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Sorry, I've okay, so... my microphone. <laughs> Do to go ahead. Oh, yeah, I just uh, to that next question about dismantling cultural patterns and organisational structures. I think it, it really has got to take, come from the leadership to be on board and to role model and to resource change and it can't be piecemeal it can't be a bit on this faculty a bit on this curriculum and we've also got to tackle colonized minds as well because education is reproduction of coloniality otherwise why are we having these uh, racial disparities um, and we've got to uh, bring our, our understanding to that and to understand what it means to unlearn because people don't seem to understand the meaning of unlearning. They get really worried about that term. But, um, I mean, education is political and hence we've got to think about this kind of decolonizing change under social movement theories under activism theories how do we as far as says get the grassroots to enable change but also you know he says about the grassroots bringing 
the attention to the people with the power to influence and make change happen. So how do we get together and actually uh, find those common purposes, common interests, what matters together to then springboard uh, decolonizing change? And, and, and anybody who comes to the table, it's got to be an equalizing space. So if people are unpaid at the table, then we need to pay them. Uh, we need to give value to their contribution and we need to show the money there as well. Um, I'm, I'm definitely doing that at my university. It's taken me about two years to get to that point. Um, but but we're there and we've got the students around the table. We still haven't got the community as yet, but they're waiting because yeah. they've been so, um, uh, how do you say, disappointed that they're not going to invest time yeah. with us at, yet. Yeah, but the students have started to come and we're starting and decolonising is starting with the black and minoritised students and also that kind of culture change about not bringing all everybody to the table but to bring those black and minoritized students and the OFS says that bring those that are harmed by your institution and center them and work with them yeah that, that's my yes. contribution well thank you that that was really useful and insightful and uh, thank you for sharing that uh, I think some really interesting points made there about the um political landscape and and the challenging through that um but I, I do agree as well with the the unlearning is a um interesting one because I think uh, again you know my own personal reflection is I, I think there was some unlearning that happened moving into the pro uh, pandemic but then we seem to have forgotten um relearned again but perhaps forgotten our unlearning and that you're right there is a, a discomfort around unlearning and um absolutely the the resource um it needs to be prioritized not piecemeal um this you know it, it has to come from that leadership and um i think that that was a really good synopsis i, I can certainly identify where that's happening in a number of different places but thank you for, for, for sharing there. So just to um, free up um, some time for a, a more open discussion, I'm going to quickly move to the, the last um, question, which is perhaps the most obvious one, given the context. Um, but how do we deinstitutionalize? Really is an, an open space to lead us into that more open discussion, um, uh, perhaps to help generate some ideas and really interesting contributions coming through, both in the chat, volunteered and in the Jamboard uh, around strategies, how we might want to do that um, and move away from that sense of just scratching the surface, but actually creating something which is much more embedded it challenges those structures um, and we start to unpick them in a way that's um, meaningful and important um, so some prompts uh, alongside this um, you know what are those infrastructures uh, that support or challenge in this space and again how do we move beyond that scratching of the surface into um, a, a more um, embedded meaningful approach and again those critical um, impacts and practices and it's really encouraging that there are organisations such as the OFS who want support in this space um, but as with with many things it's it's that um positioning um the the politics within that and also the the resource and the funding quite critically and i i haven't seen although there's an increase of money available to support uh, initiatives around decolonization um again is it are we going far enough um what else can we do uh, perhaps individually or collectively um as a as a, a sector um a, around this space so just positioning that question how do we deinstitutionalize so we'll just have a couple of moments of reflection and again feel free to post into the chat or onto the uh, jam board um, Davinia, is it all right if colleagues can also just raise their hands now and ask questions as well? Yeah. 
Yes, absolutely. I've just noticed we've got a couple of hands raised. So yeah, um, feel free to do that and we can come back to um, the questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got uh, Amrit's hand is up. Um, so really interesting. So thank you for the talk, Davinia. Um, a bit of my context, I work as a management consultant in a large consulting firm, but my research interest is decolonization, social justice, uh, but from the organization's perspective. And you mentioned the, the hierarchies that are present in higher education. Um, I think they're also present in general organizations as well. So as you come in as a grad, work your way up the ladder to partner. And you can see from the boards of all of these corporations, they're mostly male and white, right? Um, so this concept of deinstitutionalizing, I think there's a large element of racial capitalism that needs to be considered. Um, so the whole system of capitalism is racialized. Um, for example, we can't even, you know, uh, talk about racism or microaggressions or uh, the, the way that people are excluded, uh, ethnic minorities or, you know, people with disabilities, whatever, they're excluded. We have to almost make it palatable for other people in the, in the institution, whether it's white fragility or uh, kind of whitewashing it. But even even the language that we use to describe this is not ours. So it's you know we, we can't really say anti-racism. We have to say uh, we have to say diversity and inclusion. We can't really point out the problem. Um, and I think the deinstitutionalized view is not just from uh, I guess operational or uh, other systems that are in place, it's the whole mindset. And that comes mm. back down to how capitalism has is the problem. Yeah. I think I think um there's you you're right in, 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 in that perspective and it's very interesting. Um just a, a conversation I had with one of our um, uh, academics in law and um, we had a really interesting discussion that their, their research um, for one of their students is actually looking at um, whether organisations with flat structures are more diverse than organisations with hierarchical structures, um, which I'd be very interested to, to hear what the outcome of, of that research is. But what was really interesting about this conversation was the language um, as you as you say, uh, and a lot of the language which we derive, which um, for education generally, our policies and our processes are from that legal space. And it's all about compliance. It's all about um, control. And it was a it was a very interesting conversation um, around the adoption of of that language in in different sectors. Um, but education is one which has heavily adopted that language. We have policies and structures that we operate and have we actually really considered what that language means and how we challenge that language? Um, are we writing instruction manuals as a policy or are we writing um, a, a practice base sort of guidebook to how we expect people to act and behave and it's it's really interesting when I, when we look at policy language um, how that really links back to that narrative. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. We've got a hand up from Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Davina. Just wanted to say thank you, uh, first of all, for this um, thought provoking uh, talk. Um, I, I was just going to say that with our university, I'm from the Royal Holloway University of London, we've been looking at uh, decolonizing the curriculum and um, we've got a new degree that we have looked at reading lists and things like that but as you're saying going further and I would think that and I'll, I'll just like to put this out to everybody and um, as we know with university structures when it comes to marking and grading criteria we usually have a whole spectrum of things you know the use of literature the um, the presentation of it um, and all that I would go as far as saying why not add 
the diverse perspectives which would look at different um, voices, different opinions. So I think if we went and added a, a grading criteria that says to students and those of us creating assessments, um, this is something we're looking for, uh, a, an alternative uh, voice within the the marking structure and criteria. So the more we do that, I think there would be that recognition where for students to meet that or to, to get that criteria right, that puts um, the onus on us as academics to make sure that we are exploring different voices. Because as you can imagine with, with librarians, it, it can be difficult, uh, you know, mm. uh, Melanie mentioned it, budgets are a big thing. And I've looked at a couple of databases that have African and Asian um, sources. It is so sparse. So again, looking at how um, resources are, you, we may talk about having reading lists, but those reading lists have got to come from somewhere. And there is a systematic uh, inequality that exists in getting those documents out there. And we have to yeah. think about some of the cultures and places that people come from. So I am an African and my background and everything that I knew came from storytelling. My great grandmother was brilliant at storytelling, but she never went to school. But the things that she could teach me up to this yeah. day are beyond words. And yet the way that we learned or we were taught is it so far removed from what we're doing now. So I think there's something to be said about um, valuing the knowledge that is out there that may have been passed down in storytelling and, mm -hmm. and not necessarily a three page with this methodology and that methodology and um, all that, but understanding and accepting that there are ways that knowledge was passed on. And those stories are the stories that I still remember as a child. I don't even remember half the methodologies I learned for my for my master's or my PhD, but I remember what my great grandmother taught me. So yes. I think when looking at um, decolonizing a, um, a, curricula, a curriculum and certainly dis, de institutionalizing, we really need to get back to those voices that we're trying to hear, those voices yeah. that we're trying to bring to the table. Whose table are we bringing them? Are we bringing them to our table or are we asking for permission to get to their table? So mm -hmm. there needs to be a, a, an element of co-production here and not yeah. bringing people to where we are, but going to where they are and yeah. asking them, how can we um, make use of this knowledge? Because I think if we're not careful in the way that we approach this idea of uh, decolonizing, there may be a very oppressive element to it. Okay, come to this meeting at this time in this place, and yet you want to take knowledge from them. So we need to be very aware of those power dynamics again and go down to where people are and let them tell us how to do this. So that's my little piece of um, well, thank you. contribution. I, I think that's that that's fantastic, uh, Barbara, and very insightful. And I think there's something very powerful about storytelling. You know, prior, you know, it, storytelling has been around for so long, and and absolutely has stood the test of time and continues to do so if we think about modern storytelling often through social media channels more so now um but is incredibly powerful um and it was interesting i was um, having a look at um the direction of travel around ref and um, what kind of um, literature will be brought in potentially to the next round of REF. And there's much more emphasis on, on that social, it seems, which I, I really applaud because I think that's an opportunity to bring in that storytelling element much more strongly um, moving forward. Um, and I, I think that would certainly help in, in many different areas. Um, but yes, thank you. Uh we had a hand up, but it's gone down. Um, I have a question as well to pose. Uh, okay, the hand has just gone back up. Let me see. Does the person whose hands up want to just jump in? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I put my hand up because um, the person that spoke earlier was so phenomenal. And I was like, how can I top that? <laughs> I mean, my question is not. <laughs> it was so amazing. Yeah. And, and plus, my, my uh, methodology. I'm doing storytelling, so I was so inspired by what, uh, what she was saying earlier. Yeah, uh, we brought the question of unlearning earlier, and where 
well, that's one of the biggest things that needs to happen, like we all understand. But on learning mean taking the red pill, as we all like us doing the colonial work, we understand what I mean. And it's such a it's it's a whole process of getting into that. So if we see people gain into sh showing interest on decoloniality, but then pushing back, it's putting mirror back and looking at yourself, right? And realizing that everything you've known and you've been told, right, is in the way. And th that's a starting point, let alone when you start digging in and really going to the core of exactly what we're talking about. So it's not going to be an easy process, you know, and I think that's what we tend to see, with this movement that comes in and, and everybody jump in, and then we, we see that there's a lot of performativity when it comes to actually taking the steps. And I think that's what it is, because when I, when I confront, I'm using confront because when I have discussions with my white friends, especially when they're male, I could see when the unlearning becomes the things that need to go, that we need to apply into the life. I could see how they get depleted. You could literally physically see the reality of what you're saying, how depleted. And that's the starting point. And I think, yeah, I thought to brought that up. It's basically asking people to take the red pill. And whatever that is, you start from that. But um, when it comes to decoloniality, doing my research on decoloniality, I think it's, I think my thought's going to be a little bit more getting to the roots of it. And I think because it's so linked to imperialism, and colonialism and now we talk about capitalism which you know we could just see how they relate to, to one another and it does i think uh, it, it, it enable to operationalize such such machine you have to dehumanize others and you have to put mm -hmm. whiteness you have to center whiteness and dehumanize everybody around it and what that mean then you have no you never understand you have never been able to understand the reality of others so for me, decoloniality is a deeper integration of the production of difference. Because until whiteness, uh, okay, being a black, uh, black African that came in England when I was 19 years old and not understand the concept of racism and, and had to, and lived through that for the past 22 years, the thing you tell yourself all the time is you tell yourself, oh my God, you don't know me. Otherwise, you wouldn't behave this way or you wouldn't treat me this way. So it's, it's, it's difference, the treatment of difference and how much work whiteness has to do to understand the actual natural human relation that we should have between each other. Because you are literally working in circumstances where people don't understand you. Or when you go at your uni having meetings with these middle-aged white men and they tell themselves that they're trying to help. And you realize they don't understand the reality of exactly what it is they're trying to help about. So, and I'm like, what? I can't teach you that. <laughs> you know, that would take me long. Like, but, and that's what it is. So it really is about the treatment of difference and how little whiteness has been exposed to that. And, 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 and yeah, and once we open that up and start from that, I think it, it will help us move forward because you cannot want equality or, or, or the feeling of feeling or being rehumanized when you are dealing with people that you don't even know, you, you, you don't even know if they even know you. Like that's what I we deal with most of the time because your reality isn't understood at all. Let me and let me tell you through storytelling what who I am and learn in and and, and I don't want you to, to to learn in a way you understand. Borrow my lens and how do you do we borrow each other's lens to understand each other's reality from you know and let me tell you my story and understand exactly what i'm saying within my own context and if we can't do that it will make the work of diplomacy extremely hard yeah i think that's um a fantastic point um about that being able to view reality through a different lens and um as part of that unlearning process and uh, I, yeah I, I love the um reference to the matrix they're taking that red pill to yeah. to to be able to see that and yeah and and you know in in your description utilizing that storytelling which you, you have just done um through that use of the the pill um i think that is a an excellent place to start with the unlearning and um yeah. certainly something i'm going to take away from that um I myself and the, the team that I'm involved in, we have a lot of unlearning. We're still on our um, unlearning and relearning pathway. Um, but 
everybody's at a different space and I think um, it, there are these challenges to, to be able to get into that space and it always puzzles me in education that the most challenging space we're in is to unlearn and learn again. <laughs> um, there's a certain amount of irony within that but um, I think that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, Davinia, I want to ask a question before Amrit comes in. Sure. So um, we, we're talking about infrastructures to support or challenge this, and I'm just hearing what other colleagues have said so far. So I've got two things I wanted to kind of pose as thought-provoking for colleagues at this point, more likely for them to go away and think about. But um, <clears throat> one, we spoke about assessment. Uh, Barbara mentioned assessment and she started off talking about assessment, assessment practice, and looking at ways that we can change assessment. But I think there's a deeper question around why are we assessing um, and why are we assessing in this way who does it value for us to assess or assess in this way mm. and is it really the students um, and just kind of bringing up some recent conversations around AI and chat GPT the amount of, of fear that has been instilled in the academic community because of the thought of having to change the way that we assess as a result of something that has existed and has been existing around our students in large part for a while um, just kind of brings back that question of what really is authentic assessment and are we assessing you spoke about Divinia the levels you know why do we need to assess students at the end of each level um, why do we have uh, degree classifications in the first place uh, who is that benefiting and are we just feeding into a wider capitalist uh, classist culture with the way that we offer degrees and the way that we say that we are assessing learning. The other thing I wanted to kind of propose and ask the question to colleagues about um, thinking is decoloniality is a really deep topic. And so asking the question of can we can we go deeper is always important because I'm pretty sure we always can. But I also wonder in terms of looking at how we really move beyond where we are. I think there's still a vast misunderstanding of what decoloniality is, and that's why we're doing things like this decolonizing lecture series. But is it realistic to say that everyone is going to be able to do this work? Um, is it realistic to expect that everyone does this work? And is it therefore acceptable that some people engage in a surface way because that's all that they can do, one, or because that's how they start, right? Um, I think it can become a very contentious space. Uh, and it can become a very inaccessible space when we start talking about some of the very deep principles of decoloniality before giving people something that they can actually do. Um, so in terms of the questions that you've got in, in, in terms of deinstitutionalizing, yes, there is so much more depth to this conversation and, and to action around this, but actually how do we enable colleagues? Someone asked the question just now in the chat, for example, how do we do this in STEM? Um, how do we enable colleagues to just start? And I've been reading a lot more recently around what we call decolonial fissures, which are just creating cracks in the wall. It's not always, um, most of us are not going to be able to take the entire thing down, largely because yeah. of the power structures that exist and because of the, the roles that we have in the capitalist nature and the classist nature and all of that stuff. So how do we enable those who can't take down the whole wall to just create cracks and is it okay to do that uh, and how far do we stop or do we allow people to engage at a surface level without expecting everyone to engage in such a deep way that it becomes inaccessible um creating gatekeeping and creating barriers to this very conversation that has mm -hmm. has been you know sidelined because of gatekeeping and barriers um so I think it's important to think about the range of what decoloniality can mean in the context of higher education and enabling colleagues to engage with it because not everyone is going to have spent 10 to 15 years doing research on post-colonial, anti-colonial, decolonial practice or anti-racist practice. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's an important thing to consider in terms of in terms of breaking down the system. It starts somewhere. We all started somewhere, you know. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Melanie. And um, uh, it's interesting that you bring up those two questions because I, I had um, highlighted a, a, a article that I saw from Forbes. Um, I think this is a um, an interesting article, a couple of years old now, but it really is one that scratches the surface. 
but if if somebody approached me to say um let's have a a starter for 10 a starter kit for somebody who's engaged and interested and wanted to make a, a start I think it would be great and I think there is that difference between those who are starting a journey and perhaps feel they have limited resource to go deeper um compared to those who are just not engaging um so I'll, I'll copy that into the um, chat if anyone's interested. Um, but also um, just I've, let me just bring up my references. Sorry, I've not put them on the end of this. Um, I will add them into the chat. But the um, the papers which uh, I mentioned earlier on um, are really interesting in, in terms of their uh, their structure uh, to give you some examples of where we begin and how um, we can challenge that. Um, apologies if you've already come across those, but I'll um, I'll post these into the chat as well. And I think the chat GTP conversation, I was having a conversation last week and um, uh, horrified people came to me um, within the university to say, you know, well, what does that mean? I think all my students are using chat GTP. And I, I said, well, actually, they might have been using it for the past two or three years, but we just maybe didn't know about it. And I believe personally that authentic assessment processes um, are a better way forward. And I'm hoping that this movement with technology will have a pincer movement to really reflect on those challenges around assessment why are we assessing what are we doing um for example at Salford we, we um consider employability to be a priority getting into that um that job role after and I know it's a high priority on many institutions agenda um but getting into that that job straight away after leaving university is really important so why, why don't we assess why don't we prepare people by putting together something that's going to help them at interview or help them with that assessment because that's the the true end point in many ways um, um, so it's, it has driven lots of interesting conversations and I'm, I'm hoping it will support the um, not just the um, colonisation, but the deinstitutionalisation, really getting around these very rigorous structures, which um, are, are boundaries. Uh, but I, I do appreciate it's a sensitive space because we don't want to reiterate the structures which have have restrained these conversations and movements in this area so I think that's a great point. Thank you all so much and particularly thank you Davinia this has been really great and I'm really excited for the rest of the series because this has been an excellent start. Thank you all so much thank for you. engaging in the chat on the Jamboard. Feel free to keep engaging um, through this chat if you can access it after the call is done. Feel free to reach out to Davinia or to myself with any questions or if you just want to have a chat. Um, BCU is hoping to start across university decolonial decolonizing higher education space and I'll that will follow in an email to you all alongside feedback um, questions from the event but thank you all so much this has been amazing and a really great start and I'm really really excited for the rest of the sessions just so that you know tonight we've got another session led by the amazing Dr Gurnam Singh around uh, whether or not decolonizing has reached a dead end in higher education so feel free to tune back in that starts at five um five or five thirty um but thank you all hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and hopefully see some of you all later thanks to Vinya. bye thank you thanks bye